with us. We are going to open up this morning with a song we did at Easter at Coolidge called Rescuer. And if you've ever heard the Wren Collective or if you were at Easter last Sunday and you sang the song with us, we're going to do it today. And there's a part in just a minute when we start singing, I'm going to let you welcome first. And I know that you guys like to fist bump and, you know, holy hug. That's Daryl's favorite. And all those things. Wave at somebody. Say hello while uh, we're uh, letting guests come in and, and members come in from Sunday school. But I just want you to practice during this welcome time your hey part because that's part of this song. And we're going to help you out with it too. But just go ahead, look across the, the other side of the room and just go, hey. But then go ahead and welcome somebody too. Just take a minute and welcome each other.
rescuer. And his grace is so abounding that we are no longer slaves. We can stand and proclaim with such assurance that we are the children of God. This song says, I am no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. Sing it out. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy to all my fears are gone I'm no longer slain to fear I am a child of God Thank you. 
Father, Lord, you are so good to us. Lord, when we think about the many ways that you display your love for us, that you show that love to us, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you that you loved us when we were still sinners. Lord, we thank you that you love us today. Lord, we thank you that you love us tomorrow throughout eternity. Lord, we thank you for a wonderful Easter Sunday last week. Lord, we thank you for the decisions that were made. We thank you for the baptisms. Lord, we just pray that you are glorified in that on that day. Lord, we thank you that the resurrection of Jesus means just as much today as it did last week. Lord, we celebrated it last week, but it it means just as much today. Lord, we have hope in eternity because of Easter Sunday. 
because of your love for us. And I pray that you'll be with us during this time. Lord, I pray that we'll be attentive to your word. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Brian. I pray that you'll speak through him this morning. Lord, I pray that you'll be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen and amen. This morning we're going to uh, begin a new series. We're actually beginning a new series at, at all of our campuses, but they're not the same uh, series. We're about to embark on four weeks uh, of looking at all things new. I'm going to be with you through uh, the month of April, and uh, Pastor Gary will be at the Chattanooga and Hickson campuses going through a, a new series that they're doing there uh, called Jesus the One and Only. But then in May, we'll swap, and uh, Gary will come here, and, and the Saudi Daisy campus will move through that series, and I'll go and do uh, this one there. So we're looking forward over the next eight weeks to be engaging in these two different uh, topics uh, as we uh, can share together in some uh, weeks of focus. But this morning we're going to be talking about all things new. And we, we enjoy singing that song, don't we? Uh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And when we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. And we look forward to that. And we're anxiously awaiting uh, that. And, and we receive, hopefully you receive encouragement uh, and, 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 uh, and hope uh, in that reality, uh, that there will be a day when all things are made new. We take that phrase from Revelation chapter 21. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God and made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death, and there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true, and he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. And he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me saying, Come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her brilliance was like a very costly stone and the stone of crystal clear jasper. And it had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the 12 angels, or the gates 12 angels and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And then, and then there were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a, had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its walls. And the city laid out as a square with its length and as great as its width. And it's measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width were height and equal were all equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. And the first foundation stone was jasper, and the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, and the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one with the gates was like a single pearl. And the, city of the, the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, the, la the Lamb, are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, nor one who practices abomination, nor lying shall ever into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
I want to encourage you this morning. Some of the questions you have about that chapter, I'm not going to answer. I'm not even going to attempt it. Because our tendency is to read that text and miss the most important thing. Because we look at those 12 uh, layers and we think, what's this look like? And what's that look like? And what does the gate look like with the pearl? And, and what about all these different things? And it's got this name written here and this name written here and this name written here. And let me encourage you, all of that in eternity will make perfect sense. But we don't live there today. Because we could talk about all the different physical uh, description that's given, like, well, well, what's the difference between a human measurement and an angelic measurement? Did the author really mean what he said there, that, that they're the same? How about that, about that, about that, about that, about that? I, I don't know. God's got all that figured out. The thing that makes heaven most wonderful is it's where Jesus is. And the very last phrase of that text is the most important one for us to consider, which is where we're beginning this morning when we're talking about making all things new, because this is really the root of the question, have you been made new? Because when we think about that phrase and where Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new, there is this already but not yet thing that's happening because this is the, the, the making new of the heaven and the new earth and, and where the previous has passed away and this new has come. But the very last phrase is the one that must be considered with great priority, which is this, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter in. So I want us to press pause in Revelation 21, which is where you might have thought we were going to hang out today. And we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So I want to invite you to, to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to do this quite a bit through these four weeks where we're going to look at a couple of different texts together and see how they relate to one another. But this is the most important question this morning. Have you been made new? Have you been made new? And how you answer that question will determine how you answer the next. Because if I ask you the question, have you been made new, and you say no, then my question to you would be, then why not? Or what are you waiting for? Because at the end of our time this morning, I'm going to invite you to begin to be, have a relationship with Jesus Christ by grace through faith where you can be made new. And if I ask you the question, have you been made new, and the answer is yes, then I would ask you this question, then what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked. For indeed while we are in this tent we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, in order that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. You hear in these first four verses this tension that exists in us as human beings who are living in this world as redeemed people who are made for eternity, but but still held here that there is this groaning and longing to put on that which is eternal, to shed what is mortal and to put on that which is eternal. I love the phrasing that he uses in verse 4, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. That we would uh, take this, the, the brokenness and the fallenness of these human bodies, that they would be eventually swallowed up by life life. Have you noticed uh, in your own life that aging tends to continue? We, we fight it. We wrestle against it. We deny it. We hide it. We, we do a variety of things uh, to, to make it look like we're not aging. But then you look at a picture from like 25 years ago and you think, wow, might be fighting a losing battle here. I was reminded of that Thursday night. I had dinner with a high school friend that I had not seen in 26 years. And he looked rough. <laughs> I had dinner with him and his family and his wife and children who I'd never met before. And, and, and his wife asked me the question, what, is, what was he like in high school? I said, about like he is now-ish. 
you know, minus a little bit of weight, plus a little bit of hair, but still the same personalities. But in, in 26 years, it, it wasn't as though I walked into the place where we were meeting and I, and I couldn't find it because he was unrecognizable. But the reality is, is that things had changed a, a bit for both of us. I'm not saying that exclusively just unto him. But we live in this world that is continuing to, to deteriorate. And, and we're a part of that. We own that. And, and Paul describes this tension that exists within us as believers of this, of this longing. This is not a fatalistic uh, approach. It's not, uh, it's not something that's odd. But it's just an awareness of the reality that we're not made for here. If we're overly comfortable here and we're not in some way longing for home, then we may have been too, uh, become too comfortable in the land of our sojourn. But there is within us this longing to put on that which is eternal. He says, Now he who prepared for us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. But we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Therefore, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing uh, the fear of the Lord, we persuade men and we are made manifest to God. Uh, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences, that we are not again commending ourselves to you, but are, are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, that we may have an answer for those who take pride in our appearance and not to heart. For now we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. And then here in verses 14 through 17, where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose according again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away, and behold, new things have come. This morning, we're going to be talking about being a new person, a new person. Now, for you folks who are blank fillers, I'm going to leave you with great frustration this morning. I'm only filling in one of those four. Each week, as we progress through this series, we'll, we'll finish that opening sentence puzzle. But this morning, we're talking about what it is to be a new person talking about what it is to be a new person. So we're going to spend the rest of our time here in this verse 17 about what does it mean then to be a new creation in Christ? And then with application, what are you doing about it? There are five things that we can see about this new creation from verse 17. This is, therefore, if any man is in Christ. First of all, we have a new location. We have a new location. We're in Christ. That is a positional reality. He says, if any man be in Christ, he asked that as a, as a question type statement. If you are in Christ, therefore by implication, the way he asked it, there is the possibility that someone might be what? Out of Christ. So this morning, as we talk about evaluation and where you are, I mentioned before a moment ago, if you've not been made new, then, then you would put yourself in the, the group that maybe are out of Christ, that have not yet come to a relationship with him because the Bible makes that a very clear positional reality. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm sort of in Christ. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in Christ-ish. I, I, I look like I am, so therefore, am I right? Or when somebody says, I've always been in Christ, well, those are some questions that we might want to stop and consider. Because Paul gives a clear implication here that you're either in one place or the other. And so as we talk about this being a new creation, a new creature, it is conditional on, upon the reality that whether or not you are in a new location. Put your, your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want to invite you to look at Ephesians chapter uh, 2. Because Paul clarifies this a bit in Ephesians chapter 2.
I would encourage you in your own uh, time in God's Word this, this week to sort of hang out in Ephesians 1 to see all the things that God has done for us in Christ and to mark all the places where he says in him or in Christ or, or, or in Jesus Christ. But then we come to Ephesians chapter 2 and Paul begins chapter 2 with this. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Here Paul clearly articulates the two options of where you are. You are either dead in your sin or you're alive in Christ. You're either dead in your sin or you're alive in Christ. This morning, if you are here and you know that you have never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have never repented of sin and asked Jesus to forgive you and, 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 and submitted your life unto him as Lord and Savior, then, then you would be in this description of Ephesians chapter 2. And, and if that's the case, then I want to invite you, exhort you, compel you to repent of sin and ask Jesus to forgive you and, and to commit your life to following Jesus as Lord. Because that's the very first question that's got to be settled. You're either in your trespasses and sins or you are in Christ, which we find again in 2 Corinthians chapter 17 or chapter 5 verse 17. So if you are in Christ, then there are implications that come from that in this text. He says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. You're a new creation. It's a great word. The, the word new there is well translated. It's exactly what it means. It is a new thing. That word creation means it is a new original formation building creation or creature. It is not a revamped version of the old one. It is a brand new thing that has been put in its place. It is a brand new creature, a totally new thing that is there. As I had dinner Thursday night with my friend, I thought about late uh, last summer, I had the opportunity to be back in my hometown. I grew up in a town of about 1,500 people. You would think not a whole lot changes in 25 years in a town of 1,500 uh, that was my thought when I got there until I got there and basically didn't recognize the place. Because there were places that I drove by expecting to see one thing where that thing had been completely destroyed and leveled and there was a whole new thing in its place. And I, I would go to other places where I would, I would expect to see one particular thing that would bring back a particular memory and I drove back past the place and the place was gone. And some place I did not recognize was now in its place. And I thought about that Thursday, considering where we were going to be as I, as I pondered how old things had been done away and new things had been put there. That's really what this, this word is talking about. It's not that there was a, a refurbished version of the old one that was somewhat recognizable. No, the other one had been completely leveled and a brand new thing had been built. If you're in Christ, that's what happened to you. You're a new creation. The old you had been done away with and a new thing had been put there. Now, you might be thinking, well, well, well Brian, br hold, hold on. I I've heard that talk about before, but I still look exactly the same. I, 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 people still recognize me. I still, I still carry around this body that, that I had there. So, so what, are you, what are you talking about that this whole new thing has come? Because this whole new thing still looks exactly like the old thing. To which I would say, you make a good point. However, we were dead in our sins, but if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Because this body that we've been given is this thing that we, 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 we lug around while we're in this world. But when you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, spiritually, internally, you are a new creation in him. You are a brand new thing. The old you has been dead, has been, has been crucified, and a new thing has come. So while you might look physically the same, and while your accent may not have changed, and your, your hairstyle might still be somewhat similar, you are a new creation. You are a brand new being in Him. 
You're a totally new thing. The old has been done away and a new thing is there. And so with that truth, there are some implications that come from this about what this new creation might look like. And the the first thing we can see here, the third part of your outline, is that you have a new life. You have a new life. That's what he says in the next phrase. The old passed away and new things have come. What are those old things? I've been pondering a lot this week from our conversation on Thursday. Because when my friend's wife asked, well, what was David like in high school? I I thought, actually, he was the voice of reason in our group of friends. He he was reasonably well behaved. Uh, He he did drive a a pretty fast hot rod, and and, and he, he, he drove it. A lot. But aside from driving too fast, he he was really a a reasonably well-behaved kid for a a teenager. And so when I answered the question, I said, he really really didn't do much that that one would be uh, embarrassed about or ashamed about 30 years later, at least that I knew. He was uh, reasonably well-behaved. He did get a better haircut because, you know, we grew up in the days of the mullet and uh, and we had them. (laughs) You ever want to forget about those kind of things? Like, like, you know pictures exist out there, but you kind of hope that nobody ever sees them. Yeah. We had mullets that mullets were envious of. And so I, I, I told his, his wife, and said, he really didn't get into a lot of trouble. He actually tried to keep us out of trouble. He would say, no, no guys, I don't think setting that on fire is a real good idea. And, and we're like, ah, but there's four of us and one of you, and we think it's a good idea. And he's like, well, but I'm, I'm your ride home. We're like, you know, that's a bad idea. Because he had a car and we didn't. So we typically did whatever he did, and he kept us out of a lot of trouble. But boys being boys, there were still things that that we would probably not like for us to talk about this morning. Old things. You have any of those old things? If you do a word study on this word, old things, it's the word for our chaos. Word where we get our word for archives, the records of our lives. The records have been done away. Old things have been done away. As a new creation in Christ, the old things have been done away. Isn't that a refreshing and encouraging thought? If you think about the other parts of the scripture that talk about this in 1 Corinthians 13 where it talks about love, what love does, love holds no record of wrongs. The old has been done away. If you are a new creation in Christ, if you are in him, you are no longer dead in your sins. You are no longer dead in your trespasses. But you are alive in Christ. And the things that were prior to have been done away, never to be brought back in accusation against you. Because that is the, the work of the adversary, is that he is the accuser of the brethren. He is the one who would stand in accusation. The Bible talks about him being accuser. And we've all got those things in our past, in our history, that the adversary loves to bring up and loves to put in front of us and loves to bring accusation to us. And it could be something like this. Uh, you remember when you did this and you remember when you did this and you were this and you were this and you were this and you could put Brian Smith up there and say, Brian is a liar and he's this and this and this and this. And this is the response aside from Christ. Guilty. But when God looks at the believer, he no longer sees who we used to be when we were dead in our sins, but that we are alive in Christ. He sees the very righteousness of Christ. So when the accuser brings accusation against us, our only response is, but Jesus. Because the old things have been done away. I want you to mark your place there in in Corinthians. Turn over to to Colossians chapter 3. I love when God 
tucks little life-altering truths in a very short verse kind of wedged in places. It's like finding a little ridiculously valuable nugget. And in Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes these words. If then you have been raised up with Christ, see that conditional thing, if you've been raised up with him, if you are in Christ, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are in the earth. And listen to verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. If you're a Christ follower, if you are a, a, a redeemed person who has been reconciled unto God through faith in Jesus Christ, you have died to your old self. You have, you, you have you're, you're being dead in your sins. That's been done away, and a new life has come. And listen, I love that word. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You ever play hide and seek? Nobody? Wow, y'all should really play more games. Anybody ever play hide and seek? You ever play hide and seek with a toddler? They're terrible at it. They're terrible hiders. They're super easy to find. Every time they get a good hiding spot, they kind of giggle and they give it away because they want to be found, don't they? Because that's the fun part because then when they're hiding, then you, you come and you find them and, ah, it's a big time. That, that's what that picture is there of us being hidden with, in him. You, you picture this of, 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 of you've got a blanket and a toddler wants to hide and you, you hide him under that blanket that he's hidden with you. And, and there's that connection, there's that, that safety because in that hiding there, he, he's connected. That's, that's, that, that's our status, Friends is those who have been redeemed, those who are in Christ. We are hidden with him. That, that it's not our, our old self that defines us, that we're, we're now hidden with him. The old has been done away and new things have come. We have a new life in him. And in that new life, we have a new identity. I want you to think for just a moment in this idea of a new identity. If you had a minute to describe yourself to someone who did not know you, how would you do it? But here's the caveat. You can't use physical description. How would you describe your identity without starting with what you look like? How would you describe yourself? Someone was meeting you at the airport, and they had to look for someone looking for you but you couldn't use physical descriptors, how would you define yourself? You think, well, well Brian, that's crazy because if I were uh, going to meet somebody at the airport, I would want them to look for what I what? Look like. Because they don't care who I am. They just want to know what I look like. And if you read the scripture, God flips the script on that because he says, I don't, I'm not looking at the outward man. I'm looking at your heart. Because we are way too focused and way too attentive to what we look like and how our identity is wrapped up in what we appear to be or what we present for people to see. When the reality is that our identity is a whole lot more wrapped up into who we are, not what we look like. And in this idea of being in him and being a new creation, we have a new identity. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, he says, For I have been crucified with Christ, and in the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself up for me. The, 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 the repeated refrain of the New Testament is that our old self has died and a new thing is here and that new creation is in him. And it's enabled by him and it's marked by him. We have a new identity that has been put upon us that doesn't have anything to do with what we look like or what we sound like or whether we have a good sense of humor or anything like that, but rather wired into the depth of who we are. We are a new thing with a new identity in Christ. And the reality is, is that God begins this process of making us look less and less and less like us and more and more and more like Jesus as we are new creations in him. And the last thing that we can 
or a last thing we'll bring from this text, not the last thing you can take from it, but the last thing we'll look at this morning, is in this being a new creature or a new creation, we have a new worldview. We have a new worldview. Look again to Ephesians 2. Again, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verses 1 through 3 are not terribly encouraging in this text. If chapter 2 stops at the end of verse 3, then... That's not great. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. And look in, listen, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is purpose in you being a new creation. That new creation is not by happenstance, it is not by chance, it is not by accident, but rather it is by divine design. And in you being a new creation in Christ, God has divinely enabled you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the giving of spiritual gifts to accomplish things that He's designed for you. And with that comes the reality of a new process of decision-making that's rooted in worldview that's rooted in how you view the world, how you choose to do the things that you do are are largely dependent upon the outcome that you desire. And as a new creation, you have a new desire in your outcome. Because when we are in sin, when we are living according to the flesh, the the grand desire that we, we would want, that we would be moving to is to somehow fulfill the desire of the flesh. And Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians the latter part of chapter 5. But as a new creation, there is a new process of how you engage in, in decision-making, how you engage in, in things that you move through in the course of your life and the decisions that you make and the, and the things in which you engage. Because now you have been given a, a new direction. You're not merely living for uh, the joy or the pleasure of the moment and, 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 and feeding the, desire, the carnal desire of flesh, but rather you are moving forward in this idea of being God's workmanship, accomplishing the good works that God prepared beforehand for you. If you're a new creation, you're a new creation with purpose. You're not just a new creation to take up space. You're not just a new creation to be new, to put on a shelf so God can say, look at all the new things that I made. So when we come back to this question, if you are a new creation, then what are you doing with it and what are you doing about it? There are two things that we can see from this text that the way that we engage life ought to look a lot more like Jesus and less like us. Because old things are passed away and new things have come and those new things are this work that God is doing in our lives to make us more and more and more like Christ and to do the works that he's called us to do. It's not a works in order to earn salvation because that's impossible, but as a result of walking in faith in Jesus Christ, he lays out before us things he desires for us to do. So if your proclamation this morning would have been, yes, I, am, I have been made new, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, then let me ask us this question, brothers and sisters. Does our life proclamation match our life action? So if we had to describe ourselves as a new creation, it didn't have anything to do with how we looked. 
but rather on who we are. The way that we engage decision-making, is it based on the truth of Scripture or are we moving uh, to and fro on the, the, the fallible so-called wisdom of man? Or are we moving through life bent on our own pleasure and our own gain? Or are we coming to the things that come to us each day and the things that we engage in saying, Lord, what are you doing here? How would you have me to step? How would you have me proceed or wait? If your proclamation is that you're a new creation in Christ, if our proclamation is that we are new creation, does our life match our proclamation? If not, then what do you do about that? If there are parts of our lives where what we proclaim out of our mouths does not match how we move and behave through the week, what do we do about that? I want to invite you to bow your head and to close your eyes. Because right now we have the beginning part of what we do about that. We sang earlier of what a day of rejoicing it will be when we all get to heaven. The reality is is that we don't have to wait until then to begin rejoicing. We're going to sing a song together by way of response to, to give you an opportunity to respond. And your response this morning may be to simply celebrate the fact that you are a new creation in Christ. And you're reminded of the gospel and you're grateful for it. And you just want to sing and celebrate the fact that you are redeemed and you belong to him and, and you know in, in whom you belong and that, that you are a new creation. And I'm not suggesting that... that that we are obeying perfectly, but that your desire is to be submitted under the Lordship of Christ and you're walking in intimate fellowship with Him and you just want to celebrate that, then friend, I invite you to celebrate that. But if you're in Christ and you're a new creation in Him, but there are some areas of your life where you know that God is leading a certain direction and you are just absolutely not going to go there. Now would be a great opportunity to begin praying something like this. Lord, I know where you're calling, and I know how you're moving, and you also know that I don't want to go that direction. Now, I would, I would promise that he's probably not going to remove that call simply because you don't want to go, but that kind of honesty is a great place to begin. Or maybe there's some attitudes of your heart and mind that are not very reflective of you being a new creation in Christ. And you just need to bring that before the Lord and and begin to pray very honestly about that. But if you are here this morning and you do not yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I am so glad you're here. It is very much our normal process at the end of our services to give people an opportunity to respond to what God might be speaking to you. And everything I've described right now, you can decide right there where you are. You can pray. You can engage with the Lord right there. You can celebrate right there. You can repent right there. You don't have to come down front to do any of that. But this morning, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, and God is drawing you and you're feeling that tug that you're trying to ignore right now and you're trying to explain away, but the reality is is that God is is drawing you unto himself and you want to repent of your sin and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes you a new creation in him and solves that sin problem for you, 
we're not trying to point you out. It's not required that you walk down here in order to be able to go into heaven when you die. But the reality is, is that we want to celebrate with you. We want to know what God's doing. We're not going to point you out. We're not trying to embarrass you. But we would love to talk to you about what God's doing in your heart and maybe answer questions that you might have and pray with you and to celebrate with you because it is a wonderful thing for a person outside of Christ to repent and come to faith in Jesus. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when that happens. So we don't want you to make that kind of decision and to walk away and not tell anybody. We want to share it with you. I promise you, we're not trying to point you out. We're not going to bring you up here if that would embarrass you. We we just want to know that, that you've made that decision to move on from death unto life today. But maybe there are some things that you just might want to pray about and and you would like to come and have some folks pray with you. We would love to do that. That's part of what it is to be God's people together. So Father, I pray that you'll take this time and glorify yourself in it and accomplish all that you desire to do. So Lord, help us to be sensitive to you and to simply be obedient, to respond in the way that you would have for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Can we stand together? Let's sing together as you respond quickly. Lord, I come. our proclamation to you this morning that we need you. We don't just need you for salvation. We need you for for living every day. And God, we thank you that you are more than sufficient for our needs. Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege of coming today to sing to you and to to fellowship together, to enjoy the commonality of Christ and to, to share your word together. Lord, I pray that as we prepare to to worship you through giving and, and getting the information that we need as we move from this day and, and we prepare to leave this place out into a, a world that doesn't know you. Lord, I pray that, that we'll simply be obedient in all the places that you are so graciously working in our lives. We thank you for your work, for your diligence, for your determination and your endurance in working with us to make us more into the image of your Son. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you. We love you. We celebrate you. We rejoice in you. And now, Lord, I pray as we go that you'll help us to share you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Friends, let's be seated. I'm going to ask Patrick to come in just a moment, lead us through the rest of our time together, lead us through our time of offering. And for our, our home folks, you'll remember last week at Easter at Cool. It wasn't last week a great day. 
How many of you got to go down to the park? Yeah, a great majority of you. We had a wonderful time and celebrate a worship there and, and a super time sharing the gospel uh, through the egg hunt and through conversations. Had several people who made professions of faith in Jesus Christ and shared baptism uh, with some folks and they had a wonderful time of, of uh, worship and fellowship in the service. And so we're thankful for all the things that God has done in that. But if you'll remember, uh, typically at Easter at Coolidge, not typically, but always at Easter at Coolidge, we don't receive an offering that day. So I want to encourage our, our, uh, our membership, our church family, uh, to be faithful in that giving as well. I'm not uh, asking for our guests this morning to give, but just a reminder for our, our church family to, to be faithful in that as we try to steward well what God has given us, not just in resources, but also in opportunity. And so we're thankful for the opportunity he gave us last week at Easter at Coolidge to share the gospel with so many people. And so we want to celebrate all the things that he did. And if you're a guest with us today, we're glad that you're here. We're, we're so thankful that you came and, and shared time of worship with us this morning. I want to be out at the information desk here in just a moment. I would have loved if you came by and introduced yourself and let us talk for just a moment before you leave today. So Patrick, come please and lead us. Thank you, Brian. At this time, if you will take the card holders there at the end of the aisle and pass those down, fill those out for us with your information. There's also a place on the back for prayer requests. If you have any requests this morning, you can fill those out, and those requests will be prayed over multiple times throughout the week. We also use that as our tithing envelope. If you came this morning prepared to give, you can put that in there. We also have our Givelify app. If you so choose, you can go online and do that through the App Store. You can give that way. You can also give at stuartheights.org. While you're filling that out, you're um, pointing your attention to the yellow handout in your bulletin there. We have a new semester of Stuart Heights University classes coming up starting this Wednesday, April the 11th. We've got different offerings both at the Hickson campus and at the Saudi Daisy campus. If you already know, you can fill that out and place that in the offering basket when it's passed here in a few moments. just gives us a better idea of how to plan, what rooms to use, and things of that nature. So... If you already know which class you're going to take, you can go ahead and fill it out, out for us. Also, you're going to see a video here in a few moments. Secret Church is coming up uh, April 20th. How many of y'all been to Secret Church before? It's a fun evening. Uh, it's a good evening. Uh, but that's coming up April 20th. You'll see a video on that uh, here in just a few moments uh, as we take our offering. But let's go ahead and have our ushers come forward. Let's pray. Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, we thank you for this time to give back to you. Lord, we pray that you will just take this offering. We pray that you will uh, help us to steward in a way that pleases you and that is glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Secret Church. Whenever we think of church in America, we most often think of going to meet at a building, singing, praying, hearing a message from a pastor. But in many places around the world, church meets in a home or an apartment, sometimes even in secret. And many times there are just a few believers in that area who know and follow Christ. They face all kinds of challenges and difficulties in meeting together. Some places may be even dangerous. So when they come together, they want to make the most of their time in a way that maybe is different than what you and I are often used to. Yeah. Secret Church is our version of a gathering then where we meet for an intense time of Bible study. Prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing persecution. Secret Church is not for the uncommitted or the faint at heart, but if you want to know God more deeply through His Word and know His church more fully around the world, then Secret Church is designed for you. It's not just to come and learn for one night and kind of have an event, but 
The goal is to pray together, to study the Word together, and then to use what we've learned during that gathering to make disciples of Jesus more faithfully right where we live and then wherever God may lead us around the world, maybe even to places where it's difficult and dangerous to share the gospel. That's not a typo. That is 6 to 12.30 a.m. Uh, and that's at the Hickson campus. It's a wonder. Don't Please don't let the uh, length scare you. It is a wonderful time. It is. If you've ever heard David Platt on the radio, he is very intentional. He's very intense about uh, the gospel and about what it means and about what it means for all of us, much like we heard this morning. So that'll be at the Hickson campus, April 20th, starting at 6 a.m. There is a, um, it's not a handout, it's a book. But uh, it's, it's kind of a study guide. We've got those at the welcome desk. They're $10 a piece. Uh, so if you plan on coming and you want to go ahead and grab a book, you can do that this morning. So, again, let me encourage you to be a part of that evening. It's always a, it's always a good time, very intense Bible study. So uh, let's all stand, and we will close in a word of prayer. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we've got Awana and Bible study. So let me encourage you to be a part of that as well. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, we just confess to you our, our sin, our, uh, the fact that we still live as if we were an old creation, as if we weren't rebuilt like we were talking about this morning. Lord, I pray that you will just be with each and every one of us. Lord, I know that there's things in my life that you asked me to do that I'm just too scared to do. Lord, I pray that you will forgive me of that sin. Lord, I pray that you would just be with each of us. Lord, help us to, to hear your calling, to understand your calling, Lord, and give us the courage to step out on that faith and to follow you, Lord, whatever it is that you're asking us to do. Lord, we know that you prepare us before you call us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we're not on an island all by ourselves, Lord, that we have other believers that can come alongside us and encourage us and, and be there with us. And Lord, mostly we thank you for your son who is also with us and going before us. Lord, I just pray that you'll be with us this week. Lord, help us to live our lives as a new creation this week. Lord, lead us in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.